Hello and welcome to Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Kermit Whitfield, a CMC board member and Senior Assistant Vice President for Communications at United Way of Central Ohio. Welcome back to those of you who were here for the big table this morning. We had a great discussion. Um, today, CMC's forum, Give Me Shelter, is sponsored by Measurement Resources Company, Homeport, the Kelly Companies, and in partnership with Move to Prosper. Each are represented here today by many friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them all. Today we discuss a basic need for all of us, that of shelter and a place to call home. While the central Ohio market is hot for real estate, that doesn't necessarily translate into affordable housing. In fact, shelter is all but unattainable for far too many and for a variety of reasons. What can be done to address the situation? Let's talk to our experts. Please welcome Associate Dean, OSU College of Engineering and Chair of Move to Prosper Steering Committee, Rachel Cleet. Columbus City Council person, Jiza Page. Social researcher and GIS specialist at Kerwin Institute at The Ohio State University, Michael Outrich. And our host, president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Mid-Ohio and chair of the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio, E.J. Thomas. E.J., the podium's yours. Well, thank you very much. Without adequate housing, it is really difficult to have a vibrant community. As cliche as that might sound, it's something that we are rapidly seeing go from challenge to crisis unless we address it. Now, several years ago, Amy Claiborne, who's here with us, a part of Prosper, and I sat down and we tried to figure out a way to be able to advocate more effectively across the nonprofit sector for all of the different organizations that are part of trying to create a solution. And we formed the alliance so that we could show on a continuum exactly where the bright lines are between what it is that we do, the different tranches of dollars that are accessed, and the idea being that we could generate more interest for affordable housing because we're all working together and not perceived to be working apart. We did a research report, found that 54,000 families in this area are paying more than half of their income or severely cost burden for housing. So we're advocating, as many of us are, for new public, private, and philanthropic resources to construct, repair, maintain, provide rent assistance uh, for our families. Earlier this year, we released a $140 million three-year startup plan to accomplish all three of these goals. We're grateful to have the city support. Uh, our folks are here from the city development department, the 20 million for the Southside Renaissance Fund and the Affordable Housing Trust. Steve uh, Gladman, I see you out there. Thank you for your support for us for nearly three years. So we're excited. And we know in looking at Austin, Denver, Seattle, Nashville, and Charlotte, that we have the opportunity in Central Ohio to get out ahead of this curve. Because if you look at Seattle, for instance, you've been reading what's been happening out there, it has become, it went from challenge to crisis to nightmare. And as fast as we are growing here, there's no reason why we should allow that to happen here. So, Rachel, I'll start with you. You were with us from the very beginning, uh, putting the alliance together and working on these housing issues. And I know that Ohio State is very involved in this issue uh, from a planning perspective, since that's your background. Yeah. So I guess the, what I want to say about this is that um, I'm, so I'm here as the chair of Move to Prosper. And one of the reasons uh, we started Move to Prosper was because we saw that, uh, the, saw the housing crisis that's, ha that's going to be happening here in Columbus. And what is it, 75% 75, 75 of those who qualify for housing subsidies in the United States don't get them. So that means that when we're talking about Section 8 or talking about other kinds of subsidies, we're talking about, about a very small portion of the people who actually need some sort of support so that they're not shelter, shelter board burdened, so that they're not paying so much of their income for rent that they can't pay for other things. And then the question is, what do people do if they do get that support? Where do they live? Where can they find housing? 
if people can't afford uh, to live, and uh, they can't pay more than, I don't know, a third of their income for rent, where are they gonna find housing if they make $20,000 a year? The $54,000 54, 54, household number that you talk about, EJ, is actually households at $20,000 um, $20, a year or less of income. So if you think about people being working every day full time who earn $40,000 and are trying to support a family, they're still cost burdened. So actually that number might even be an undercount of the number of people, the number of households that actually need support. Wow. So one of the questions is where is the affordable housing? Is it all in one place? Is it in places where there are good schools, where there's safety? Do people have choices about where they live? So these are the kinds of questions that we're thinking about a lot when we, when we create Move to Prosper, which is meant to support uh, women, single women uh, who choose to move to a new neighborhood with their kids um, and help them transition to that place, learns um, the skills that they want to learn with regard to financial management, health, if they want to set job uh, goals, that would be something they can do. But this is really about giving people the choice to make different, um, different aspects of their life work better for them. Well, thank you. And, and of course, single mothers obviously are raising a family. Michael, I know that you have uh, a, a, a personal story uh, that I think relates to the work that you're doing now and the schooling that you have put yourself through. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure I keep it um, uh, moving along. So essentially, yeah. So uh, in my I, first off, so I aged out of the foster care system up in Cleveland. So in terms of family ties and other things, I don't have much of that. Um, so, but despite all of that, I moved down to, to my undergrad at Ohio University, uh, and uh, I struggled, and I was actually homeless while going through school. Um, the wait list uh, for affordable housing in Southeast Ohio was really long. It was two and a half years um, to be able to find a place. Um, I was able to figure out a way uh, staying on campus, which was nice, but uh, when it came to move off campus, I didn't have a co-signer. So I had to pay the rent, uh, the entire year's rent in full, because I didn't have a co-signer. And I did that uh, even when I went to, I got accepted into Ohio State for grad school um, to do my master's in city and regional planning. Uh, and for those two years, I again had to pay the full year's rent up front um, ahead of time, because I didn't have a co-signer and my credit history wasn't long enough. Uh, and so um, it worked really, really hard <laughs> to, to work around a budget to make sure that all was accommodated and fine. Uh, and so I, and now I work full time um, and I still facing some of these slight challenges and barriers. Um, but uh, Michael, share us a little bit about the GIS work that you're doing. Uh, yeah, certainly. So um, I work at the Current Institute and I look at their opportunity mapping. Uh, initiatives, uh, looking at um, places around uh, various regions that we partner with um, that have areas that have high opportunity, areas that have access to high opportunity. So good schools, um, good adequate housing, good transportation, good job apps access, uh, and then areas that lack that um, and, and don't have as much resources. And so when you're able to look at that, um, you're able to uh, be able to compare areas with each other uh, at, the, in the reg at the regional level and you're able to uh, target resources effectively. Um, and so that's one of the projects. I also do some food mapping work, uh, looking at food insecurity. Uh, and then outside of Kerwin, I am uh, the youth advisory, uh, youth action board um, for Columbus uh, for their youth uh, homelessness demonstration pro project. So there was $6.1 million grant that was awarded to address youth homelessness in Columbus. And so uh, I'm on the Youth Action Board because uh, uh, trying to get more youth input because uh, I've lived that experience and I want to address that uh, and grow that voice uh, as they're trying to change that policy. Well, Michael, you have a, a unique background and it would seem to me that uh, throughout your career you're going to be able to add a lot of value uh, not only to the institution where you're working but also to young people who uh, may never know your name. So thank you. Councilwoman Page uh, hit the ground running. Some of us from the Alliance went in to speak with her when she first uh, became a member of City Council. And all of us were impressed with how uh, eager she was to learn more about this issue because there are a lot of moving parts to making affordable housing work. 
she now is chair of the Housing and Economic Development Committee. So uh, given your experience uh, with council so far, what are your thoughts? I just want to thank Michael first for sharing your story with us. And for me, that's really why talking about affordable housing and having this conversation is so important. Because that 54,000 number that we hear, those are real lives that are being impacted. Those are individuals in our community each and every day who are looking for a safe and decent affordable house to live in. We receive emails constantly at City Council, the Department of Development, for single mothers who are looking for a place to live. They have multiple children. They want to send them to the best school that they can. In, but they can only afford six, seven hundred dollars a, a month for rent. And to them, that's still a stretch. And for me, again, it's really being impacted by those stories and trying to do the best that we can to affect and change those lives. And I'm so proud of my colleagues on council, Mayor Ginther, for the work that we've done most recently and passed legislation in July around our incentive policy, which really has a focus on affordable housing. Now, how we define that, we're constantly thinking, what does affordable housing mean? We have a lot of different ways to look at it, but we are focusing with this legislation on working families and requiring developers in throughout the city in our post-1994 CRA areas, hope I got that right, Director Shodi, <laughs> to provide 20% of their units <laughs> 10% to 80 AMI and another 10% to 100% below AMI to those families. And that is a great step in the right direction. We know there's a lot more work that needs to be done, but I am proud to work with a council and a mayor who is, has affordable housing as a priority. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Clyde, let's, uh, Dr. Cleet, excuse me, let me come back to you. We've all heard the numbers that over the next 15, 20, 30 years, we're going to have three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 more folks here in the area. With your degree in urban planning, you're in a position to see through a set of filters in a way that we can't that may help to put um, some put a box around exactly what we're getting into, where we can expect growth in the city, and how we need to maybe look at the affordable housing issue in the context of that incredible growth. So I think I would put this in the context of um, Insight, I'm going to get the name wrong, Insight 2030, 2040, right? I can't even get the name right. I know it's going to talk about this. 2050. 2050, I'm sorry. So I can tell you the content, 2060, I mean, I was thinking about that. Maybe we need to you know, go out another year. Um, Insight 2050, which is um, Morpsey's Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission's uh, effort to do some scenario planning about how we might take this growth. And uh, uh, there's a, there's, 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 there are scenarios at either end of the spectrum. One is we continue growing out and we grow on uh, green fields, or uh, we take it all in our current urbanized form, urbanized footprint, or there are two scenarios in the middle. And I think that the, the region working together has come to the understanding that they're gonna be somewhere in the middle. So that means what we should be seeing is more infill, um, more dense development, like we might see in Franklinton, which looks very different than a lot of what's there now. Uh, but even um, on High Street, we see a lot more density on High Street. And so some of these uh, incentives that we're seeing are really aimed at that land use pattern, trying to change what that pattern looks like. Um, and, and it's, what has been interesting about this to me is that we, as a, there's no mandate for us all to all work together in Central Ohio. But we have, and the different municipalities have been implementing guidelines that allow for us to take this growth in a way that will enhance the richness and diversity of, of our region. I think the question is, though, uh, when you're talking about developing housing, a lot of the rental housing especially is coming in at the top end. And we would have to, we would have to build a lot of new luxury housing in order to have filtering happen to a great enough extent that we could house 54,000 people in an affordable manner. And even then, those are not gonna be good units necessarily that, that they're living in. And so the question is, do you wanna live, if you're raising a family, do you wanna live in, the, in, in a unit that has filtered through the market like that? So for a lot of people, affordable housing means low market, class D rental. But again, do you wanna live there? Where would you want to live and raise your family? So I think for, we need some, so as a region, we need to come together to talk about how do we preserve affordable housing where it exists now, 
uh, like on the, on the south side or in the east side. Um, how do we um, how do we invest enough so that homeowners who own affordable own housing now in those neighborhoods are not pushed out? How do we change our tax codes? Um, and then how do we build housing that's actually already affordable? And how do we make our subsidies last over time? Which is some of the, some of the discussion that they're, we're having now in Columbus about a, a land trust uses a subsidy that you pay once and you don't have to pay it again. Right now, every time we have the end of a subsidy period for affordable housing, we have to re-up that money and find it. So long-term affordability is a more efficient way for us to be setting up our, our, our long-term, uh, well, long-term affordability is a way to think long-term, how's that, about our a future of affordable housing. Thank you. And one of the ways that many of the nonprofits that are involved in affordable housing are trying to help with the density issue is to work uh, pretty diligently on the repair piece. I know Homeport's got a great repair program. Uh, we're working with them as Habitat, and uh, there are many others out there that are trying to figure out a way to preserve what already exists uh, because you've got a lot of folks in these areas who bought their homes 35, 40 years ago, paid it off 20 years ago. They would love to age in place, but they can't afford the fixes that inevitably are going to occur or to be needed on a home, nor are they physically able to handle them on their own. And so for our organizations to step in and help with that, we, we cover a lot of different markers uh, with just a simple repair. Um, Michael, I'd be interested as you look forward, um, what you see in the central Ohio area. Uh, very, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's really tricky depending on what scenario we pick, right? Um, if we do more infill or we do more uh, greenfield development. Um, one of the things that uh, is key to, to look at um, is, is looking at, um, obviously, the city of Columbus, um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this in a way that um, is, is constructive. Um, well, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> now, there's okay. a setup. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, obviously, uh, when it comes to uh, income uh, inequality, uh, that's growing nationwide, as well as poverty, right? And so, um, one of the research things that I've looked at in terms of the trajectory of poverty um, in, in Franklin County uh, is not only is it staying concentrated in certain areas, like in Hilltop, in Linden, um, but it's also spreading out. Um, it's staying mostly within the, the Columbus City School, Columbus City of Columbus boundaries, but it's it's, it's spreading out and it's growing in numbers. Uh, and so uh, the number of people in poverty that is. Um, and so if we don't address, find ways to address that with the affordable housing component, um, you know, we're gonna see spikes in homelessness um, and other detrimental impacts that come with that. Uh, and so I hope, you know, with, if we all work together um, and, and address this issue head on while we have the opportunity, because like if Amazon had number two, headquarters two comes here, like, what it will do to housing uh, and cost in housing um, is, would be a concern that I would have personally. Um, you know, and so it all depends on a variety of different variables, right? That's kind of how this is. Um, no city's mastered this. Um, they're affordable housing completely. There's always going to be need. Um, there's always limited resources. Um, but again, as long as we realize that we're working with an a la carte menu and we're all we all have funding uh, in place and we can work together to share pools of funding to address this problem, I think we'll definitely make significant progress. But can, I, can I add something for that, Michael? Mm -hmm. the, the, one of the things I, I think it's important to realize is that for folks who are renting in that part of the, the bottom part of the market is that they're, they're housing unstable. And so they have very little control over their income or over things that happen in the marketplace. And so the response is to take control. These folks are, you know, they're trying to do the best they can and so they move. They're very housing unstable. They move a lot. Like they may move once a year. They may move one, more than once a year, once every three years. So what impact does that housing instability have on children, on families, on the ability to hold a job, the ability to stay healthy, to exercise, take care of yourself, cook meals, all of those things. And so we're, so housing, so that it's, it's, so there is, so we have these issues of inequality, of income inequality, and we see spatial inequality increasing 
and we're, I think, according to City Lab, no, Urban City, City Lab or something, we're like the second most, um, I think it's Richard Florida's group, um, we're the second most se income segregated region in, in the United States, at least as of a few years ago. And that's increasing. And so that has a huge impact on people's lives, given these inst the instability that people face in the marketplace. And so if we want to um, actually continue to be a prosperous region, we need to really address this. Well, that's, uh, you're absolutely right, Rachel. And I think that uh, we had uh, Dr. Megan Sandell here a couple of years ago, and she has the best sound bite in the world for the need for housing, and that is that that's the vaccine. And when you think about having to move every two or three months, if you have a child who is going to a different school system, trying to socialize with new friends, get on board with a new curriculum, uh, then come home and study in something that uh, is considered substandard housing, where maybe there's not enough room, where you can't get away so that you can study, and you have siblings that are doing what siblings always do, and that's drive their brothers and sisters crazy. Uh, it makes it very difficult for a child to stay uh, on some sort of a glide path that's going to lead to success. So, uh, Councilwoman Page, you have folks coming into your office all the time as a function of uh, just being available to your constituents. Um, we as the affordable housing community are part of that constituency, and so how could we be more effective is there, are there things that we should be doing that we're not doing in order to garner the attention of policymakers and increase the amount of traction that we have? Well, I actually would say that I think that the Affordable Housing Alliance and other advocates in this space are doing a great job. Definitely with educating elected officials on a local level and state level as well on the issues that our, our residents are facing. You give us the numbers, we have graphs, we have a lot of information. So I've found the relationship and the communication with you all has been amazing and I truly appreciate it. And I think now it's really just buckling down and looking at the most vulnerable population, which again, I know that the city is really trying to focus on that too, and figuring out what we can do for individuals that they really need their rent to be subsidized. And it needs to be long time, I mean long term, and so that we can figure out how to move them to the next place in life. And it's providing those wraparound services, looking at wages. I mean, this is truly a multifaceted problem that we have to address from a lot of different ways and a lot of different um, resources, but I do believe that the conversation and that the relationship right now is great. It's just everybody getting on board and moving forward. Oh, good, thank you. Rachel, let me come back to you. Uh, we talked about some of these other cities that are in dire straits. If you were to go to them, if you could turn the clock back, uh, jump in your DeLorean and, and uh, <laughs> What would you say to a Seattle 10 years ago or 15 years ago to help them avert the crisis that they're in right now? Actually, I lived in Seattle 15 years ago, so. What did you, well then the question is, what did you tell them? Actually, what they should have been doing 15 years before that. So when, if you're anticipating growth, and certainly Seattle was anticipating growth at that time, um, that's the time before the crisis hits to land bank. And we have, we, we're land banking right now. We do land bank, and that's, that's appropriate. Uh, that's the time to get land cheaply so that then it can be turned over for, um, for the construction of affordable housing, and that housing should be high quality. Um, one of the things that Seattle did do was they had a linkage program. So you could build taller in the city, because you know, everything in Seattle is about views, right? Like the views of Mount Rainier, views of the bay, right? So. Uh, if you could build taller, you had to pay for it, and that money went into a fund to build affordable housing in other neighborhoods in the area, in the region. I think Boston has a similar linkage program, maybe in the 80s, actually, for a very, very long time. I, so I think there is, um, but the, and the reason you have to start early, so I think we're in a good place now. We still have places where you can get a rental house pretty cheaply. We should be preserving those houses. We have been a city where we've not had as much um, teardowns of our vacant housing, right? And that's an opportunity to, to the extent that it can be repaired uh, because it's the, the most expensive thing about a house is the land. And so if you can get the land cheaply, you can build other housing. That, so the, 
so th that's so that's what I would say in Seattle. What the other thing that I would say is to form a land trust early on. Uh, Durham did that in North Carolina. Um, Burlington, Vermont has the oldest land trust in the nation. And um, and I don't actually it doesn't have to be a land trust. It could be any kind of housing that is permanently affordable in, in shared equity housing. I, I think that's really the, the, the only way to preserve affordable housing over the long term without continuing government support is with these shared equity models that allow for an investment and the preservation of that investment over time. Let me follow that up. Uh, as you look at other cities, those who would throw up their hands might say that, well, you know, once you get so big, this is just going to be a crisis and there's not much you can do about it. So whether you're Austin, Denver, Seattle, Nashville, or Charlotte, you're all going to be in the same boat. That's just the price you're paying for all this tremendous growth. My guess is, Rachel, that you see some differences that, that are nuanced enough that we might be able to learn from those uh, going forward. Well, so I think some places that have had inclusionary housing have actually been getting rid of it. So California has, um, or had, mm -hmm. uh, state-mandated inclusionary housing, and um, that has been slowing down in, there. Uh, Massachusetts, as a state, has an inclusionary housing program that allows, there's an idea that every jurisdiction, there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, that each of them has to have 11% of their housing mm -hmm as affordable. I don't know how they got to 11%, but they did. And so a developer can come in to a town and propose a development that's affordable, and the city, the city, the town, they have to accept it, unless they've done some other kind of planning to make arrangements for affordable housing. And so that, that's um, Chapter 40B in, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, another, so a lot of these, so I guess one of the things I, I always wonder about with inclusionary housing is when you have extraordinary um, income inequality and you have one jurisdiction in a fragmented region doing inclusionary housing, you're not really um, creating, you're, you're creating affordable housing where it exists and you also have to do extraordinary community development in those places, make sure there's good schools or safe, you have good, good infrastructure. Um, but what about the other places? And kids grow up. And what about families who don't want to live in those neighborhoods? Lots of families want to stay, but some, some families don't, and they don't have the wherewithal or the money to move. So I think that if you do inclusionary housing, it has to be on the regional level or even at the state level, because you have to, ha have to cover the entire market area in order for it to be truly effective. Thank you. Well, Michael, you work at OSU, and, and Dr. Cleet works at OSU. Do you agree with everything she's saying? Well, I don't know if you noticed. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. I, yes, absolutely. That would be very ideal, actually, honestly, to have it um, at a regional scale, um, so that other jurisdictions. Because if you think about it, right? If you're a jurisdiction that has the resources and the good schools and the good property taxes and other things like that, what's your incentive other than wanting to? Um, I don't want to say altruistic, but like, unless you want to do it in good heart, right? You don't have it from an econ a purely economical standpoint, right? Um, you may not want to part with other areas that could get you a higher return. And so um, having a regional scale or a larger scale um, affordable housing model like that, um, where everybody has their fair share in a way, um, gets at that and allows, it doesn't, it, it, it works in a way that makes sure everybody's paying that. And that helps with getting those people into better places um, and, and having them have some choice, right? And so, because I liked, I liked what you mentioned about choice initially, right? If you think about your situation, right, and you have X number of dollars, however much money you make a year, right? And you think, okay, well, where can I live so I'm not cost burdened? Um, where can I live, right? What community, what house can I get? Where can I stay, right? Um, typically, as your income drops, you have less of a choice, you know? so. Um, the lower your income is, the less chance you have, you know, to, to be able to find a place unless you get roommates or other certain situations, right? That's what I do. Um, that's how I'm able to make ends meet because uh, I have roommates and it works. But you know, if I had kids, I don't think I'd want roommates. Um, you know, but to be able to afford to live in an area that would require me to do so, you know, you have to make those sacrifices. I also want to add one other Seattle story, if mm -hmm. I may. So um, Seattle implemented growth management in 1990 and put gr urban growth boundaries around 
their urban centers. And of course, an urban growth boundary um, restricts the amount of land, which can drive up prices. So, but, they all, but, there was a, but there was an affordable housing component to the plan. And so the east side communities, communities on the east shore of Lake Washington, very wealthy communities, um, got together and created something called a regional coalition for housing, where they um, paid general fund monies into a central trust fund and used it to create deed-restricted housing. And they've been doing that for 30 years. 30 years, 20 years, whatever. Um, and so it's, it's, it's managed out of the city of Bellevue, Washington, and it was their response because they wanted to control how, the, how that happened. And so it's all single family homes with a deed restriction, and it's sold to the next person for at an affordable price. So, so Michael, Councilwoman Page, do you want to add there something? No, no, please jump in. <laughs> well, just going on, you know, what, what we've been talking about, and I really do believe that's one area we can improve. I think Columbus has really taken the lead on talking about affordable housing and our community, but it has to be a regional approach and a regional conversation, especially as we look at this 2050 plan. Everyone is not going to move into Columbus. When we think about the Worthington School District, I believe 40% of their students are on free or reduced lunch, and that's in the Worthington School District. A lot of them do live in Columbus, so and they're, they're in that win-win district, but all those parents aren't going to necessarily want to stay in Columbus. And they're going to be looking at this entire region for affordable housing options, for school options, and a lot jobs. And for me, we do have to come together as local leaders, as development directors, as auditors, whatever, whoever you are, to really talk about this on a much larger scale and figure out how we can provide those options for everyone. I told you that she was taking her job and as, as it relates to affordable housing seriously. Thank you very much. Now, Michael, I just have to ask before we go to suggest that you all come up with your questions. Did you get a ride down today from Dr. Cleet? Uh, I did not. No, because you, you agreed with her so quickly. I thought, you know, his, <laughs> his ride's in jeopardy here. Um, we will, what we'd like to do, as always is the format here for the Metropolitan Club, is to provide the opportunity for folks to ask questions. So in the next few minutes, I know there's a mic back there, Andy, or is it right there? Got you, you can see Andy pointing to it. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to, uh, to queue up there at the mic, and in a couple minutes, we will take those questions. As we come to the end here, before the questions, are there any uh, recap kind of comments that you would like to make? Michael, we'll start with you. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I really appreciated the conversation on kind of what was talked about today, uh, and I've seen some name tags and some other different organizations here that are interested in this con uh, topic, and so I thank you all for attending uh, and sharing your interest in this. Councilwoman Page. I echo Michael's thank yous, and also just as you lead today, really understanding that Again, that number, that 54,000, these are real lives. And when many of us were 16 years old, um, excluding Michael, you know, we went to school from our home that we maybe lived in for since we were a child. But there are 16-year-old students who are getting picked up from the shelter or getting picked up from a home or their friend's home because they don't have their own roof over their head. And we definitely need to make sure that we are thinking about them each and every day and what we're doing. And I think that that really speaks to the pressing nature of this problem. People grow up fast. And so what do we do now? So I always think about the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. The perfect solution would be to pick, fix the system that created this. It would be to get a lot more subsidy dollars from perhaps government sources, but we don't see that happening soon. <laughs> Maybe from Columbus, excuse me, but but not from the federal government. These are, this, this is really a local deal at this point. The federal government has retrenched. This has devolved down to us, and it's a pressing problem. And even at the current level that it's at, it's a pressing problem. Never mind what will happen in 10 years. Thank you. Well, it is that time, uh, and folks have taken us up on our offer. So if you would state your name and then state your question, and please keep in mind that if there isn't a question mark at the end, then you're making a speech. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is question time. My name is Sana Barrett, and this question is for Dr. Klee. Can you tell us more about Move to Prosper and if rental support is needed, where is the funding for it? All right. Um, so, 
Prosper is, has 10 families right now, a pilot project, to help single moms uh, moved uh, to neighborhoods where there are um, opportunities, good schools, good jobs, uh, and safety. And they make the choice that they want to move to these neighborhoods. We have currently uh, 10 families, 20 kids, who've moved into suburban school districts this year. And uh, they've just moved in, so they've just started school. The goal is not only housing, though, because it's not just about housing. Housing, housing programs don't solve economic problems. They don't solve job problems or human capital problems. So moving is not enough. Uh, when the women were asked what, what did they want the most, they said they wanted financial management help. That was the thing. A lot of them can't live in um, some of these neighborhoods normally because their credit scores are terrible or they have evictions on their records. So one of the things that Moves Move to Prosper is doing, we're working with landlords to adjust those expectations about credit and eviction history with the promise that we're gonna work with them and help them stabilize in the housing. So this is a, so we're trying, we're very much on the ground working out very specific problems and also giving very specific opportunities around job, uh, job, job opportunities, training, uh, financial management, health, and also mobility counseling. So that's, that's moved to prosper. Um, now, you asked where the subsidies come from. That's a great question. Because, again, as I said, the, the federal government um, seems uninterested in maintaining, well, they're maintaining their, their costs right now, which was nice, who knew that? Uh, but seems uninterested in, in increasing the investment in affordable housing. And so, what I mean personally, what I'd like to see is a full investment in the National Affording ha Affordable Housing Trust Fund, first of all, have that be fully funded, so we have another stream of housing. We could bond fund. We could have uh, braided funds from private developers. Um, but housing subsidy, if it's a housing support for rental subsidy, that's maybe, maybe there's social investment we can be doing, the social bond somewhere. We have a certain number of people who are served by it, and, and as a result, we get paid back. We get uh, someone invests, so you have companies who invest in the, in the um, good, and if you produce that good, then they get a return, then we get to keep the money that they basically invested. So there are ways of doing this they are not going to be at the scale that government funding could be. And the next question. I'm Glennon Sweeney, and uh, I really appreciate the conversation, and I couldn't agree more that a regional approach to maybe a fair share policy would be fantastic. Um, you know, but I look and there's a city of Columbus table here and I don't see a city of Bexley or Dublin or Worthington table here. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how to engage other jurisdictions in a regional conversation. Glennon, and a lot of the information that I have about suburban poverty actually comes from Glennon. So if you have questions, I know she's amazing. She works at the Kerwin Institute, and she didn't, we didn't plant this question, by the way. But it's really engaging the various jurisdictions around Columbus and again with that 2050 plan helping them understand that this is a problem for all of us it's not just Columbus and if you don't see it now you will see it in 2050 and it'll be too late then and it's really again having those conversations and as you were saying this is a problem that we need to address today Hi, my name is Steve Heiser um, what I, as we've been discussing it seems to be a a problem with with many, many aspects to it. Um, I guess I'd ask Dr. Cleet, what does th the big data research show about children especially who grow up in low, uh, in, uh, low opportunity neighborhoods? And is there a, is there a, a region that, ha that has successfully, has begun to successfully um, move toward uh, a multifaceted approach that, that helps solve these, this problem? you know, this the housing problem. Because building single family homes or even multifamily homes is, an exp is a very expensive way to, to build housing. Thank you. Yeah, it certainly is more affordable to provide rental subsidies for people. It's cheaper for the investment, frankly. But they're not permanently affordable. And you can't, and people may not be living in the neighborhoods. They may have to live in neighborhoods where there aren't good schools, et cetera because the vouchers or the rental subsidy isn't accepted everywhere. So the, the, the question is though, the, um, 
he asked about big data. So Nathan Hedren and, Ra and Raj Chetty have done a study of, have looked at the 20 year results from the Moving to Opportunity study, which was in five cities starting in about 1990 around the United States. Um, 5,000 families uh, randomly assigned into um, 5,000, sorry, public housing families, randomly assigned into uh, a Section 8 voucher, a Section 8 voucher with counseling and having to use that voucher in a place with 20% poverty or less, and then no impact, no, uh, no voucher at all. And there weren't, the 10-year the results were not very promising. The only thing was that for girls, for teenage girls, they had higher self-esteem and were, I think were less likely to have a teenage pregnancy if they lived in, a, in an area that had less than 20% poverty. The 20-year results, though, show that um, there is a, a lifetime earning difference for the kids who even spent a year in a non-poor neighborhood. Uh, and that's about a $300,000 difference in their lifetime earnings. So these kids are probably in their 30s now. Um, and then other big data work that's, so they did that by managing, by matching a lot of big data to find, to find the people who were in those studies. The other big data they've looked at is they've tr used, um, they've been able to locate people in their county and then see where they grew up and where they end up. And people who, uh, who are white tend to stay, and if they grow up if they're in a white neighborhood, in a non-poor neighborhood also, they tend to stay there. People of color are not getting there, and if, you, and if you grow up in poverty, you're more likely to stay in a poor neighborhood. We don't have a lot of mobility uh, right now for people who start out in poverty or for people of color. And again, this is a problem. If we're gonna become a majority minority society, we have to do something about this. Uh, Dr. Cleet, as it uh, relates to Move to Prosper, I assume you're assembling a data set as you go along with the work that you're doing there? Well, what do we, so we just have 10 people <laughs> right now. So it's a so, very small data set. <laughs> so right now it's a very small data set. Yeah, Jason Reese is, our, um, is the evaluator for this project because I'm the chair. I can't do both of these things um, because it's a conflict of interest. We are raising money right now to do a demonstration project with um, hopefully 100 families and then uh, comparison groups as well. But we wanted to first figure out what we needed to do. Uh, we could, so we started this with a small group of like five people talking about what would it look like to do a rental subsidy program that wasn't funded by, by uh, the government. Because this issue, this pressing issue was really bothering, bothering us. Like these kids are growing up and people can't move and they can't do the things they wanna do for their families. What are we gonna do? And so again, I'm, I don't want the, the good is, is the perfect is the enemy of the good, okay? It's a short-term subsidy for three years. Again, because where are you gonna find the money for this? Um, so hopefully uh, we will learn enough in the pilot to be able to do a real, a real demonstration program. Um, and the pilot data, which we are accumulating, will help us hopefully raise that money. And so you would anticipate getting to 100 families when? <laughs> Or is that fungible given that you're- That's fungible given, yeah. I think, I mean, I think we were hoping to be able to start in a year, but I, I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, the, the, the steering committee is trying to figure out, and our partners are trying to figure that out, but I think we're learning, I'm learning, I know that we're learning so much right now from just doing this, that I, I we have to talk again about what our plans are. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, next question, please. Hello. My name is Marcus Roth, and I'm with the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing Ohio. Um, so we've been talking about these issues for many years. It's kind of gratifying to hear uh, this conversation at this level and see that you know the media is really paying more attention to it as well. Um, Columbus Business First has been doing a great, uh, great series on the affordable housing crunch, the dispatch, and it's gratifying to see the city take up this issue as well. Um, but as a lot of you have said, it's going to take more than just localities looking at this issue. Um, we need partnership with the state and federal leaders. So unfortunately, as we approach the, the election season, we haven't heard a whole lot about uh, housing, affordable housing from the candidates running for office for the state and federal offices. So I guess my question would be, um, what do we need to do to get this issue of affordable housing on the agenda for the next leaders of the state? Why don't we ask you to 
take a whack at that. No problem. And it's, again, knocking on their doors, scheduling meetings, and letting them know that this is a, a pressing issue. And if they're not willing to listen, go to the next person and talk to them. And then holding them accountable when they're on the ballot again. You know, I, I am so honored and proud of our local officials, Mayor Ginther, President Hardin, and the rest of my council colleagues who are who have affordable housing as their priority. And I know that there are conversations going on with our neighboring jurisdictions, with other mayors, but for the state and federal levels, it's really just going to them and saying, this is an issue for our residents and this is an issue that we need you to address right now. Thank and you. if you need my help, let me know. I'll go with you. <clears throat> and from the Wineland Park Collaborative. <laughs> Uh, my name is Susan Colbert, and um, I would like to direct this question to Dr. Cleek. In reference to the uh, Move to Prosper initiative, can you elaborate on how the community, civic, corporate, and church partners could support the work of this initiative or even expand to that 100 people or more? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that's been um, interesting to me about doing this, starting from nothing and going to something over the um, past couple years, is that we have, we've talked to hundreds of people about this locally, and people who I don't think of as being normally in the affordable housing community. Um, so, um, so if people uh, want to get involved, they can certainly donate money, there are volunteers. I think that there are things people can do in their communities. I th what I think you probably should be doing is um, using your vote in a way that supports affordable housing. Ask your candidates about it. I don't, if you think it's important, we can walk up, we, we, have, we, we, can, we have power to do something about it. But I think that the, the power of philanthropy is important, the power of local action is important, and I have to say this is a unique region to have this conversation. Very good. I'm Jane Scott with the Metropolitan Club. As we are improving um, lots and lots of different neighborhoods from Old Oaks to Franklinton to Victorian Village University District, I'm assuming that property values are going up and I'm also assuming that um, the, the base um, property taxes are going up. Are we forcing some folks out of their houses because they can't pay their property taxes anymore? And is there any way that, that someone's been in a home for maybe even decades, that that property tax could be um, grandfathered or something that would allow that person to maintain that home and not be a victim of gentrification? That's a great question. And yes, unfortunately, families are being displaced as property taxes are rising and just the cost of living is rising as well. That is an issue that will have to be addressed from a state level, and I know that we are you know, talking to our state leaders and hope that that can be something that can be addressed because we are very aware of it here on the local level as many of the neighborhoods that you have talked about are places where particularly aging residents are being displaced because they can no longer afford the property taxes. That's one of the issues that uh, could be addressed depending on how a land trust would get put together because the investment that's placed in it has to stay with that property. So there's a natural breaking action in terms of selling a home and dampening the demand in that area. So that may be one, one area that can, can help. One more question and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Yes, I really appreciate this forum and I can't say that I, I don't agree with everything all three of you said, all four of you said, I guess. Um, but um, uh, we talked a lot about how we can fund affordable housing and there seems to be a stereotype, and I, I talk to a lot of young amateur investors that buy a house in an in a affordable neighborhood, uh, fix it up, rent it, and then I talk to them six months later and they say, the people wrecked the house, I didn't get my rent, I'm selling the house. Um, and and, and uh, as I said, it, it could be a stereotype, but um, are we doing anything to educate renters um, to, to know how to care for a house and and, and budget their money to, you, you mentioned, Doctor, there was a, a complicated issue, but I think we need to do it with the masses so that we can, we can get rid of that stereotype because I think that keeps a lot of people 
out of those kind of investments. And I think that that, that is one of the answers to the problem. Like you said, renovating uh, affordable housing and in affordable neighborhoods and renting it to people at affordable rents. Thank you. And one thing that council has been doing, we have been hosting eviction prevention, also like tenant rights, tenant responsibilities workshops across the city. We've done about six or seven and are scheduling three to four more throughout the course of the year. And it includes not only what, again, what your rights are as a tenant, but also your responsibility. And I would say that sometimes lack of education can be a barrier to receiving affordable housing because you you need that education in order to, you know, budget management, just family, you know, crisis management. Thank you very much, panel. Uh, Kermit, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you very much, EJ, and thank you, speakers. I hope you all enjoyed today's forum. And I would just point out, when I was in the big table discussion this morning, in our table, the very first topic that came up was affordable housing. So I know this is something that's on a lot of people's minds. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, Homeport, the Kelly Companies, Measurement Resources Company, and our partner, Move to Prosper, and our speakers, Rachel Cleet, Jiza Page, Michael Outrich, and EJ Thomas. And thanks to all of you for being here. We'll see you next week.